inside the first curve, outside the second curve. So let's take a look at what this thing looks like. physics equipment. Pointing, so two cosine theta and one. So find the area that lies between the first curve and the second curve.
Yes, it is. Okay. So, first off, are there any questions on the homework? Can you do number 19 on page A64? did that. Is that there? So here's kind of the diagram. This is the area you want, right? So there's a circle of radius one, so that's pi. So we really just have to find the area of this guy and subtract it. And to find the area, we need to know, you know, we're going to integrate over theta, so we need to know what these intersection points are. So we get that by equating uh, the two equations, uh, two r cosine theta equals r, so cosine theta equals a half. So the cosine is a half if, you know, it's, it's 60 degrees or pi over 3 on both sides here. And so you end up you end up with this expression. So it's pi, right, area of that circle, minus integral, right? And where does this come from? Well, remember, we're using sectors, one half r squared area sectors. So r, in this case, is 2 cosine theta. So one half two cosine squared. I don't know if you want me to go through the integral, I can. But. Okay, now it's just like converting Cartesian to polar. Yeah. Just converting Cartesian to polar right now. Stuff. Well, we don't need to do that here, do we? Well, it's x squared plus y squared equals 2cx. We're talking about the same problem. Oh. No, it's the different, you have a different problem. It's problem 19, but it's on a different page. A64. Yeah, okay, I didn't do that one. Okay, find the polar equation for the curve represented by the Cartesian equation. Sorry. That's okay. I just didn't pay attention. So the Cartesian equation is x squared plus y squared plus y squared equals 2cx. So it looks like what you have to do is you have to complete the square here. Find the polar equation. 
Okay, so, hmm. so, <coughs> well, maybe I didn't have to do that, I don't know. Hmm. Well, okay. X equals R cosine theta. Y equals R sine theta. I just waste my time. My intuition is off. So if I pull it in here, I just get R cosine theta minus C squared plus R sine theta squared equals C squared. Yeah, I don't know that I had to do that. I'm just going to end up multiplying this through again. Okay. So maybe I wasted my time. All right, so R squared cosine squared theta minus 2RC cosine theta plus C squared plus R squared sine squared theta equals C squared, so maybe I didn't need to do that. Uh, I add these two together and I get R squared. So R squared equals 2RC cosine theta. You can divide out an R. 2C cosine theta. I guess I think that's the uh, to C, not part of the cosine. So I guess that's the formula. R equals 2C cosine theta. Which actually, what I did actually is nice because <laughs> this isn't even something they wanted from the book. But if you look at these two, right? Does everybody know what this is? The equation of? You know what that's the equation of? You should be able to look at that and say, I know what that is. That's a circle whose radius is Brandon. Daniel's not here. I think people must have a uh, Benjamin here. Must have a sixth sense. I know when uh, what I'm doing is not as important. Who can tell me what that equation right here is?
23? Okay, find the area. You know, I know that as soon as I erase that board, someone's going to ask me to do that one, right? I hate it when I have to think. Oh, okay. 
So, I think some color that I think might help. So just think of this circle, this curve here. So if I integrate from pi over two, what's up here is pi over three on this curve. Get this little section here, won't I? So what does that look like? <coughs> Try and keep this synchronized. So from pi over two, does it matter which way I do it? pi over 3 to pi over 2. And what was that uh, function there? That's the little one, right? That's r sine theta. Uh, or, I'm sorry, it's r equals sine theta. So it's 1 half sine squared theta. OK, so. That's the area of this little piece here, right? From here to there. On this curve, now I want to go from here, from 0 up to pi over 3. Right? So I'm going to add 0 to pi over 3. And now that equation is r equals square root of 3 cosine theta. So I square that and I get 3 cosine squared theta over 2. It's kind of a visual thing at this point. This integral is I'm sweeping from pi over 3 all the way up to pi over 2. And on this one, I'm sweeping here from 0 all the way up to pi over 3. And, uh, should I go through these? Wait, um, why is it pi over 2 for that upper limit? Uh, here? Or, yeah, here. Yeah. Well, um, think about if I'm going to find the area of this whole circle, right? So I have to start down here, which would be negative pi over 2, and I'd have to sweep all the way up here. I'm going to do a sanity test on that, right? I'm, I'm claiming if you integrate from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 for that circle, so that's 1 half square root of 3 cosine theta, cosine squared theta, that that should be the area of that circle, which is pi r squared, which is 3 pi. So let's see if that works out. So. Uh, Let's take the square root of 3 over 2 out. And how do I integrate cosine squared? It should be like uh, tying your shoes at this point. It's going to be cosine 2 theta plus 1 over 2. So that's going to become negative sine 2 theta over 4 plus theta over 2. I'm saying from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. We get 
this doesn't come out right. So I'll have to quit. Better hope. Okay, what's the sine of pi? Pi over two plugged in here is pi. It's negative sine of pi. Zero. Zero. Plus, uh oh, it's not coming out right at all. Oh, don't worry, it will come out right because I that I'll square root three over two out of this. Okay. So that's uh, pi over four. I subtract negative pi over two plugged in again at zero minus minus pi over four. So that's pi over two. Sorry, so pi over two. So that comes out to be square root of three or five. So it didn't come out right. Hmm. And I decide it should be square root of three pi. Where did I go wrong? I don't know. So if this isn't right, maybe that isn't right either. Hmm. <coughs> Wait, wouldn't you want to integrate the first one from zero to pi over three? Okay, when you say the first one, we're talking back here? Yeah, the one half sine squared. Because you want to find that little blue area, right? Right. So that here's pi over 3, and there's pi over 2. Isn't that what I want to integrate? What were we saying back then? I thought it was uh, z from 0 to pi over 3, because that would be the place well, where 0 going. would be from here, that would be the whole. From zero to pi over three. Yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's what this is on the little circle. That's the red area. On the blue area, from zero to pi over two would be this. Would be half the uh, circle. Although again, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I can Let's repeat. So this should be the half, half the circle, right? Oh, well, <coughs> first of all, this the square root of three gets squared too, so that should be three. Fix that. That doesn't help that much, does it? I still have that problem. I'm, I'm off by a factor of four. I don't know. You only have to. What happened if you kept going? Mm, okay. 
okay, all right, let me think about this. So, in zero, zero, r sine theta, uh, this guy, r cosine theta, and zero, cosine is one, so this is at zero, theta, let me put a little table here. That's, that's one of the problems here, is we're, we're dealing with theta and r, it's like, I can remember uh, for that uh, clover leaf, right? Each one of these is going around how much? Like pi over two, or pi? It's going around pi. So, okay. So, so let's say theta, and let's just look at this guy. So if theta is zero, cosine is one, so this is square root of three. Oh, now I'm beginning to think I know where the uh, I made a boo boo here. The radius is not square root of 3, is it? Where is it? Oh. This is telling me that 2C. Oh, OK, OK. Oh, there's the 2. So you see here is the radius, right? So when I go look at this, what's the radius? Pi over square root of 3 over 2. Okay, that explains a lot. So the radius is the square root of 3 over 2. What's its area? Pi r squared. So it's so the area of this guy is actually... 3 pi over 4, right? And that's what was messing me up over here because I kept getting 3 pi over 4. So this is all correct. That means this is correct. Okay. Somebody need me to explain that hole I dug and how I dug myself out? <coughs> okay, so what I forgot this is just coincidence that this problem was asked before this. This problem tells us that if you have this equation, uh, r equals 2c, well, let, let's use, how about, let's say, d cosine theta, okay? This is the equation the circle with diameter d offset d over 2. That's what it tells me. I use 2c is fine, or actually let's, let's say uh, 2, I'm going to use big R for the radius, right? This point is big R, 0. Radius is big R. So, when I looked at this circle here, the first time, I forgot that there's a factor of 2 there. I used square root of 3. And then when I tried to integrate it, I kept getting the wrong number. Or I thought it was the wrong number, it was the right number. But the area of this circle is just 3 pi over 4. So if I integrate it from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, put that back. Right. I get this, see this should be 4 pi. If I go through this calculation, I get 3 pi over 4. So that tells me that I'm on the right track here when I say I want to integrate here uh, this guy from This guy from pi over 3 to pi over 2. Right? That's just that little, that's what this is. That's the red. Right? This 
equation is r sine theta. No, I'm sorry. This equation here, r square root of 3 cosine theta, that's this circle over here. So now, my, my, my diagram's now out of proportion. This, this should be much smaller. But that doesn't really matter. Uh, so I'm going to integrate from, on this circle, I'm going to integrate from what? Red equation, and integrating from 0 to pi over 3. That's over here. Sine squared theta over 2. And the blue equation, integrating from pi over 3. Over two, and that's three cosine squared theta over two. Okay, that's it. That's tricky. How do you do it without blue and red? Okay, so shall I finish it? This should do it. It's just a question of now. Uh, question. Raise your down pole. I wonder how many are down there. Just one right now. I could pull it out, but then I'd have to destroy my extremely sensitive physics equipment. I'll wait till after the class. Okay. Uh, Again, sine squared theta or cosine squared theta, that's cosine 2 theta plus 1 or cosine 1 minus 2 cosine theta. 
So you can, I know you can all do that. Okay, other, other questions? My homework. Isn't math fun? If it was easy, it wouldn't be as much fun. Yes? Or number 37 as well. Okay, yeah, tell me the page again. Page? A70. A70. And I'm sorry, what was the number? 37. 37. Use a graph to estimate the value of theta for which the curves. Now that's 34. Find the exact length of the polar curve. R equals theta squared from 0 to 2 pi. Okay. How do we do that? So uh, our equation is R equals theta squared, theta between 0 and 2 pi. So that's going to be a spiral, although it's, it's getting bigger. Uh, what does it go to from 0 to 2 pi? So at the maximum, it will be this distance will be 4 pi squared, which is 36. You want to find the length. So what was the what was the strategy? Well, we want to find x and y, right? So x equals r cosine theta, which is theta squared cosine theta. Y equals theta squared sine theta. And we have to find uh, dx d theta. Okay, it's going to take a little work here. Theta squared times the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And then cosine times the derivative of theta squared. y d theta, okay, same idea except now we have theta squared cosine theta plus 2 theta sine theta. And now we want to integrate from 0 to 2 pi using our length formula, which is the square of each of these. Okay, let's start squaring. So we get theta to the fourth sine squared uh, minus two times that, which is four theta cubed sine theta cosine theta plus 4 theta squared cosine squared theta. So that's this guy squared. Now that guy squared is the fourth cosine squared. You see, see already where this is going? There's going to be some simplification with sine squared plus cosine squared. Okay, here we have plus 4 theta cubed this is a lot like that problem we when we derived uh, derived this the other day, right? Uh, and finally, plus four theta squared sine squared theta. Okay, so these two cancel right away. 
we have sine squared plus cosine squared here and here. So this becomes 0 to 2 pi. Is that me? Yeah. I'm sure it's not that important. But since it'll give me a chance to catch my breath. never know how important something could be. This is my wife. She says, I put the word out that, you, that I want you to meet Donut tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to understand, Donut is a cat. And that helps a lot, right? Donut's a cute little kitten. Looks he looks a lot like a cat we lost recently. He's a flame point Siamese. So, wife spends all her days helping poor cats for free. So now we're totally lost my track. No, I didn't. This is theta to the fourth plus theta squared. That's all that's left, and in fact, you can take out theta squared from here. Theta squared, one plus theta squared. Okay, now that actually doesn't look that pleasant. Does it? I'll tell you what it does look to me like. It looks like uh, integration by parts. Right? If it was just theta there, that would be good, right? Can I continue? Did anybody get this far and, and fall apart? What number was this? 37. Did anybody get this far and say, oh my god, what do I do with that? Because if you didn't, to go on. That's what you're not telling me. Yes. I do need to go on? It, it might not be a bad idea to look this one up either. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go with my instincts. I'm gonna say f equals theta squared g prime equals the square root of one plus theta squared. I may, I may be sorry in a minute, but so that would be 2 theta, and g would be what? Now I have to find the antiderivative of 1 plus theta squared. Wouldn't it actually be theta on the outside, because 2 dot theta squared would be the square root of it? See what problem? An attentive student is what we all, all want. All the things want. Oh yeah, uh-oh, now it's easy. Right? And just say u equals 1 plus theta squared, du equals 2 theta d theta, theta. So this becomes 1 half square root of u du becomes u to the three halves, one half, three halves, the twos go away, equals u to the three halves over u 
just to save my bacon there. Kind of. One plus beta squared three halves over three between zero and two pi. Okay, so one plus four pi squared over three minus zero. There you've got it. Questions on the homework? Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I've told people this individually, along with certain other folk. Oh, uh, Catherine, you're getting a green light, so you can take that now. Uh, I, you know, it's really good to work yourself out on these things because sometimes math problems are hard. Uh, I can't. I can't give you something like this on an exam because, you know, you might get it in a couple hours, but by then class will be long over. So what you really want to know, you really want to understand, is the basics here. The basics are, if you want to find the length of something like this, you, you write it as a the parameter, as parametric equations in x and y. And we use this formula, which I'll repeat here. The length is the integral from a to b to the square root of y dt squared, where t is the parameter, in our case theta, but it doesn't really matter. Right? That's what you really want to take from this. And you know, I'll give you a problem to do that's like this. That you know, if you know what you're doing, you won't have to spend all class, you know, all the test period going crazy. Um, same thing for the area. You know, you have to understand that you know we're integrating along here, and we have a formula. We're using. We're basically breaking this up into little teeny tiny arcs with the angle so small that the arc formula works. They're infinitesimally small. It's an integration. All right, any other homework questions? No more homework questions. Okay. All right, well, I'm glad we spent lots of time on that because, what, it's not 2.30. Oh, it is. Spend an hour doing that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad because the next this section I, I want to de-emphasize anyway because this is a math class and this section is on applications to physics. And so uh, the takeout from this, I'll be very specific about what the takeout is from this, but I just want to spend a little time. Is anybody here a physics major? Anybody here chemistry, biology? Oh, goodness. Oh, okay. Makes it all the more important that I widen the scope. I'm going to make it as wide as possible. So, uh, any poli sci people here? <coughs> or history? You guys, you just don't even like. I'm not asking what you, your declared major is. You can't really have one yet, right? Interested in history? Anybody interested in politics? All right. Does anyone know who a guy named? Snowden is. Yes. Oh, okay. So you are interested in politics. Right? Why is this guy Snowden important? And what does that have to do with physics and, and calculus? Well, Snowden did something really radical, right? 
now he's hanging out in Russia, wondering what to do with himself. Does anyone not know who Snow is? I don't know. I took major class last quarter. I'm sorry? I took major, major class last quarter, like online class, and mm -hmm. my teacher was like, no, we have an article about him. Yeah. That the things he did. Yeah. I mean, you know. I think what he did is, I don't know, if it's right for me. I don't know. Well, he certainly it's interesting. He, he definitely <laughs> broke the law. Question is, should he have broken the law, right? And having broken a law that he should have broken, I mean, the, the recent news is that this, what was it, this, it was a court, I don't know if it was the Supreme Court, the court basically said he was right. What the, what the NSA was doing was completely illegal, completely overstepped, right? And we would never even know they were doing it except that he did this illegal thing. So hopefully none of you will ever in your lives be faced with a decision where you need, you're, you're thinking, I need to do the right thing, but if I do the right thing, they're going to crucify me, right? Or I'll have to run away to Russia. <laughs> but uh, the reason I bring up Snowden is that Snowden is not the first person to have done something like this. Uh, I think a good example of this would be the precedent for this case. There was some New York newspaper. They had to deal with illegal information or illegally obtained information, but the consequences of the information was uh, illegal in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, these things come up. These are political science kind of questions uh, that real people are sometimes faced with, people who didn't really intend to. So uh, in the uh, in the 60s, there was a, I'm going to forget his name, but there's a famous case called the Pentagon Papers, where someone released information about what the US was doing in Vietnam. And it was eventually published, and the guy eventually was exonerated. Very famous case. It was Google Pentagon Papers. You'll find it. But everybody knows about the Pentagon Papers. Um, I'm just going to put the name of someone on the board. His name is uh, William Davidon. And uh, he's on the board for two reasons. Uh, one is uh, he's probably the most unknown character that fits into this discussion. Nobody, hardly anybody knows about him. You can Google him now and find out about him. But uh, in the early uh, 70s, I think around 1970 or maybe it was 1972, he was a professor at college in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And he was also an anti-war activist. And he thought, uh, as many of the anti-war activists thought, they thought they were being spied upon by the government. They thought the FBI was spying on them and doing things to ruin their lives. But they didn't have any proof. So uh, he put together a small group of <coughs> trusted people. And they broke into an FBI office and stole all the uh, files. This was in uh, Media, Pennsylvania. And uh, they then sent them to newspapers and distributed them. And uh, it was revealed that the uh, director of the FBI had been doing extremely illegal stuff for decades. And in a way, it's much, he's much more important than Snowden, because in the 60s, most people you talked to thought, oh, you know, the government wouldn't do anything bad. People really believed this. They thought, you know, no, we trust them. We trust the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover, he gets the bad guys. 
But in fact, uh, he was uh, doing terrible things. Uh, he was bugging uh, Martin Luther King. They tried to discredit him. They tried to uh, make him commit suicide. They tried to they tried to get him to commit suicide. Uh, they threatened people quietly. They couldn't do it out in the open. Uh, and because of Bill Davidon's work, uh, this got exposed. Uh, specifically, a program called Cointel Pro. Cointel Pro, which is counterintelligence. I don't know. Yeah, counterintelligence. Yeah. Uh, he, the government was spying on anybody who Jagged or Hoover didn't like, which meant if you were a little left of center, you were in trouble. Uh, so, um, and nobody knew about Bill and these people for like 30 years, 40 years. Uh, long after the statute of limitations was gone, they kept it quiet. But uh, in the last few years, it did come out. There's a book out called The Break-In. You can read about it. You can Google it and find out all about it. So, why am I in my calculus class on the day I'm going to talk to you about physics? Talking about Bill Davidon. Well, everything interesting I've ever learned about physics, I learned from Bill Davidon. <laughs> <coughs> and I had no idea he was such a crazy guy. He was the most, probably the most brilliant professor I had. But we knew nothing about this stuff. Uh, a friend of mine who kind of had heard he was a radical, like, he says, hey, come on, let's go talk to Bill. We went in to talk to Bill. And he said, he said well, Bill, we heard you were a radical in the 60s. And Bill said, no, I don't want to talk about that. Little did we know that Bill was hiding this dark secret, and the FBI was after him. Okay, so let me, let me try and tell you some things that Bill taught me that I've never heard anywhere else. So uh, there's a really deep connection between physics and magic. Now, let's talk about physics for a second here. I know you guys, this isn't a physics class. And this is not the takeaway, it's just the cool stuff. In physics, we have certain things that are conserved. Does anybody know any of those? Uh, momentum, interval. Slowly. No. Momentum. Energy, matter, and Hold on, hold on. Uh, mass. Energy. Anything else? I think it's. Well, that's the entropy. That's pretty good. But yeah, there's also entropy. There's also uh, a charge. You know, plus or minus charge. So, what Bill explained to me and, and my class was that each of these can be explained by a symmetry. Symmetry. So, for example, momentum is explained by the symmetry of three space. All right, now some of you may not know what momentum is. Momentum is usually we call it T, is a mass times a velocity. So, I wish I had a little toy car. I'm in a little toy, oh, here we have, we have a little toy car. So, if a car is moving, it has momentum. And if it bounces into something, it's supposed to fly off, it keeps moving, right? Momentum gets transferred. And, uh, you know, Newton uh, was aware of this, but he wasn't aware that 
you can explain this simply by the fact that space going in this direction is the same as space going in that direction. It's just a mathematical property. It would have to be true unless the universe is somehow distorted. Uh, in the same way, mass energy is based on a different symmetry, which I hope someone will object. It's the symmetry, symmetry of time. In other words, going forward in time and going backward in time are completely symmetrical. Are you going to object? Well... Doesn't seem that way, does it? Yeah, there's time energy... Well, time energy, what was it? Uncertainty within the quantum spectrum? Yeah, there's uncertainty, but, but yeah. here's the idea. Let's say, let's say you saw uh, a video of a train going down the tracks and you run it in reverse. Well, you, you might realize that trends usually don't go backwards, but there's nothing in the physics of it going backwards that's really all that different. Now, there are some things where that doesn't seem to be the case, like if you explode a bomb. It's very, very difficult to unexplode a bomb, right? Uh it'd be pretty much energy concentration, I guess. Yeah. But in theory, you know, a bomb exploding, there's nothing in physics that says it can't happen that way, that all the energy just kind of zonks back right into place and you have a nice little bomb left. Uh, the reason that doesn't happen is uh, it has to do with something called entropy. And it just doesn't happen, but in principle, it could. If you had zero loss. Right. Everything just completely in reverse. Sometimes they do that in movies, right? They'll make time go backwards by running it backwards and um, explode and everything comes back together. Okay. Uh, I don't know what this, I think the, ch the charge, I think it's called isospin which is so obscure I can't really explain that. Um, Something to do with electromagnetic waves. And, yeah. 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 There, there, there is actually a, there's another symmetry whose, uh, there's an equivalent uh, conservation law. It's called just uh, parity. Do you know what parity is? Even at all. It's, it's kind of like even or odd. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you look at my hand, this is which of my hands? The right one. Oh, left. It's on the right. Yeah, it's my left hand. If you look at this <laughs> hand, right? It's the right hand. Now, if you looked in a mirror at my hands, what would happen? They would switch, right? So that's, that's parity. Uh, and th there is something which, if parity were perfect, it would be conserved. It turns out that parity isn't conserved perfectly. It's almost perfectly conserved. But uh, there's, a, there's an experiment uh, some uh, physicists did in the last, I guess the last 50 years, and they showed that uh, for a certain atom, the spin of these electrons is slightly more in one direction than the other, which means that the universe is not perfectly symmetric when it comes to parity. Um, okay. So, Okay, all I really wanted to get across is that there's a reason that we, we can give you math problems with physics in them. There's a good reason. There's a deep connection between the two. Uh, symmetry is really, study of symmetry is really mathematics. Um, 
although physicists need to do it quite a bit. Okay. Um, I guess we're going to take a break, and then we're going to actually going to do some hard stuff. So we'll do some real stuff. So take a break. value and polar coordinates, you know, specifically park length and area. Okay. Yeah, take five minutes and I'll I'll get back to what I was doing. And if you want to find some real stuff. Google Bill Davidon and see what he was up to in the 70s. wants to see donut, they can come up here. See, it's kind of brown, and so there's dark, and it's white. It's cool. It's a little better picture, but there's something. I didn't, I didn't do that. Uh oh. <laughs> I get this every day. I'm taking pictures. Daniel knows this. 
Is there a cat in the box? Schrodinger's cat? It's a cat in the box, yes. The cat in the box has a name. Schrodinger's cat? It's Schrodinger's cat. It's not a real cat. It's a, it's a Gedanken. So we know in the German. thought experiment by Gedanken to satirize. Uh... Yeah, there's, there's parts of quantum mechanics that are what they call the interpretation of it. You know, there's the math and what it tells us, tells us what the experiments will come out, but it doesn't tell us what's going on. And uh, there's this uh, thing called the Copenhagen, Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. It says uh, something, you do an experiment, you see what state it's in, but before you do the experiment, it's kind of by, it's in both states. It's in a superposition of states. So uh, Schrodinger wanted to explain, to show the absurdity of this. So he created a, an experiment where there's a cat. It's in a box. Nobody can see the cat. And inside the box is a, uh, it's an experimental apparatus that's, you know, some Something either goes in one direction or another. But we don't know which direction it went because we haven't looked in the box. And based on which way that experiment goes, a vial of poison is released into the box or not. So according to the Copenhagen interpretation, the cat is both dead and alive until we open the box and look. This is, actually, the experiment is uh, there's a radiometer and there's a nuclear isotope there. Yes. The general conclusion is that, of course, the cat is dead. No, it's going to be alive. Mm -hmm. You could open it. But mostly, Schrodinger was being incredibly sarcastic about it. Yes, oh, yeah, he thought it was absurd. He thought the interpretation was absurd. But it, it dominated physics probably for 40 years until someone came up with an alternative view, which is even, to some people, even more absurd. What, the many world interpretation? The many world interpretation. Yeah. Many world interpretation says every time there's an experiment like that, you don't have to do an experiment, but every time, you know, something could happen or not happen, the universe divides into two versions of the universe. But then there's an issue with this. Yes. So it's billions of, billions, Quadrillions of times a second, the universe is breaking up into two parts. And one part goes in one direction, one part goes in another. So in fact, there are countless numbers of you. In some of the universes, you're dead already because something happened, the world went differently, the universe went differently. And some, Probably most of them you don't exist. In, in some of them you're, you know, Donald Trump, I guess, or, you know. Anyway, it, it, it's considered equally absurd by some. That's it. <laughs> Usually the thing is that after a certain point, everything reduces to a somewhat deterministic classical system. It's kind of weird. Research was recently uh, did experiments finding out how this conversion happens. They've been actually able to detect how fast it converts to reasonable sentence. You mean how fast the wave function? How fast the uh, ideal quantum gas turns into an ideal classical gas. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Well, I mean, to say it's a classical, classical simply means classical phenomenon dominate, it's still quantum mechanics going on underneath. The behavior of the two is significantly different, but it's been seen that the quantum system always becomes a classical one after a certain size or time. Yeah, but, but it, it, it behaves like one. But it's still quantum mechanics going on, as far as we know. Okay, is everybody back? No. Uh, does someone want to just take a look outside and see if Audi is there?
continue. Okay. So uh, we're going to deal with two concepts today, uh, which you're going to be minimally responsible for. They will not be on the quiz. Um, the first has to do with a physics concept called work. Now, do not substitute your own version of work yet, at least. Um, in order to understand work, you have to first understand what a force is. Anybody tell me what they think a force is? Uh, Give me an so example of a force. Hmm? Accelerates sometimes mass along a unit of accurate. No, that's the, we're going to get to that, but no. I'm, okay. So I'm going to I'm going to attempt to apply a force to this desk. I'm pushing on the desk. Did everyone accept the fact that I'm leaning on the desk and I'm pushing it? But it's not moving, is it? It's not great enough force. Hmm? It's not great enough force. It's not great enough, right? There's a there's a, there's another force. I'm pushing on a desk in one direction, but there's something pushing back. Does anyone know what's pushing back? Friction, right? But it is possible for me to push on a desk and have it move. And if I am pushing on it and it's moving, I'm accelerating it. It doesn't accelerate much because of that friction. But if there were no friction, this was an ice skating rink, and I pushed on the desk, it would accelerate while I was pushing it, and then it would keep going. And I hope you're at least marginally familiar with this formula, F equals MA. Now you all know what acceleration is. So the bigger the mass, the smaller the acceleration for the same force. The bigger the force, the more the acceleration. So what work is, is, and this is, to me, this always struck me as a weird idea. I'm applying a force to something, and I apply it, it starts moving over some distance x. I'm transferring energy to the object, because once I, it gets moving, at least if it's frictionless, it keeps moving forever. That means I've given it more energy. So work, which has the units of energy, is a force applied over a distance. It might help to know what the units of energy and force are. Let's take a look. Force is mass. That's a primary unit. Acceleration. What's, what are the units of acceleration? Meters per second squared. Distance per second squared, right? So if this is force, force times a distance, the units are going to be mass distance squared over second squared. And that's actually the units of energy. In fact, if a, an object is moving, you have a mass, let's say one kilogram, is moving at one meter per second. The energy is one kilogram times one meter per second squared. That's one half that. It's the amount of energy in a moving object is. Now, uh, I'm going to just make a side note so you understand why uh, I'm going to try and avoid anything <coughs> that has to do with pounds. Some people think kilograms and pounds are the same thing. 
they're not. Uh, 2.4 kilogram, no, 2.4 pounds per kilogram. It's mm -hmm. on the Earth at sea level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, a pound, the English system, a pound is considered a force, not a mass. And a money. <laughs> and, and a kilogram is a mass. And we equate them by thinking of what is the force of gravity on a kilogram mass at sea level. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to use English system because it's really confusing. You don't really have to understand it. But again, the idea here is, if you put a, apply a force to something over a distance, a constant force over a distance, you get uh, work or energy transfer in the amount of just that F times X. Now, this would be totally physics and totally uninteresting to us, except that rarely do you have a constant force on something. It's usually a changing force. So, if you have some function where force is applied over a distance, instead of finding <coughs> You know, just a simple multiplication, you're looking for the area under that curve. And to find the area, what do we do? We, we use calculus, right? Um, so let's take let's take an example. So we have some strange apparatus where we have some particle, like it could be an electron or something. It could be, we have some strange gravity machine and we can produce any kind of force we want. And <coughs> when we look at the object, a distance from the origin, the force on it is x squared plus 2x. Now, because these problems are physics problems, there's going to be units, and I want to know what to call the units. So, force is, remember, it's mass times acceleration. But the units are kilogram meters per second squared, which is called, interestingly enough, a newton, after Sir Isaac Newton. So the force here is x squared plus 2x newtons. So what we want to know is, if this object is one meter away from the origin, and we move it to three meters, how much work have we done? And once you get beyond the physics, it's all just a very simple, it's just a very simple calculus problem. We have x squared plus 2x, um, x some kind of parabola, and we just need to integrate from one meter to three meters. So that equation looks like this. One to three, x squared plus two x, that's the force, times x. Um, actually, it's not times x. We're integrating, so it's the dx. That's an integral I know everybody can do. Uh, a more typical problem involves 
physics involves a spring, right? With some kind of mass on it. Um, okay, so now here I'm going to introduce a vocabulary word which is really poorly chosen in physics. In physics, we have what are called laws. And uh, laws are not what they what you would think. Laws are not like theorems in mathematics. They're just true. Laws are uh, kind of things we, facts, yeah, that are experimentally observed under certain circumstances. So, in particular, the force from a spring is typically it's in the negative direction that you're pushing or pulling, right? You squeeze a spring, it pushes back. You pull a spring, it pulls you back. It's in the negative direction, some constant times the distance. Uh, this actually is going to be important. You should pay attention to this. We're going to uh, after this section, we're going to look at something called the differential equation, and uh, this will this will come up. This is called Hooke's law. It's a law, which is to say, it's observed to be true, and I really should say, sort of. It's not all springs precisely reflect Hooke's law. And all springs, if you pull them far enough, what happens? They stay. Yeah, something bad happens. And you stretch the metal beyond its point. Okay. There's a big selling point when I bought these glasses. But it hurts. Call it memory metal. It just means it. It'll be so it's law better than most springs. You can just pull it far enough and break it too. So don't don't think of this as some kind of this isn't like energy conservation, which is just it's not a law. It's a, additional terms apply. Additional terms apply. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, typical problem with a spring. Uh, a force. This is the problem. A force of 40 newtons is required to hold a spring stretched from its natural length of 10 centimeters, that's, think of that as the origin, to a length of 15. Okay, so that's going to tell us what this constant is, right? We just plug in 40 newtons equals negative k. Well, this x here is the difference between 10 and 15, 5 centimeters. So k is equal to negative 8 newtons per centimeter. That's the first part. So the question is, how much work is done stretching right here. Oh yeah, something to be careful about here. Newton's is, what are the, what are the, uh, what did I say the uh, kilograms were? Meter per second Kilogram, square. meters per second, per second squared. squared. Now, K has centimeters in it. See what, see what I'm concerned about? We get meters and centimeters, and I kind of want to get rid of them. Right? So how am I going to do that? I, I have to 
kind of introduce 100 here, right? So it's really <coughs> minus 800, well, we could say Newton, Newton meter, Newton, Newtons per meter. There we go. So now our units are a little more reasonable. Okay, um, so the problem is how much work is done? So how much energy do we have to put into the spring to stretch it from 15 to 18 centimeters? Well, I'm going to go from 15 to 18 centimeters. Well, it might help to get our units right. 15 centimeters is 0.015 meters. 18 centimeters is 0.018 meters. Is it a 0.15 to 0.18? Is this like 100 centimeters to one meter? Yes. Thank you. I'm thinking millimeters, aren't I? Yeah. Okay, so we just need to integrate over this distance, 0.15 to 0.18 meters. Our force, which is negative k, which is now negative 800, times x, right? It's not a constant force. It varies with the, the distance, dx. Okay, so this is going to be negative 800 x squared over 2 from 0.15 to 0.18. Uh, it comes out can anyone, anyone understand why, suggest why this comes out negative? Mm -hmm. And it's going to come out negative, right? Oh, uh, it's the uh, force opposing what's making it uh, yeah, it's move like, away from it's the like, natural light. Like the energy is moving into the spring, so it's Towards zero. Taking energy away from whoever is pulling it. So, uh, yeah, this up, this comes out to be 1.56 newton meters. Newton meters. And a newton meter is energy, and it has its own name too. It's called a joule, spelled G O U L. J E W. Okay, so that's one kind of problem that you're going to see. Um, uh, the next section is a little, little trickier. This is why I, I brought some visual aids here. You will observe, I have constructed here, I have a long bar, and I have on one end a little weight, and another end a bigger weight. So what I want to do here is I want to balance it. Millimeters, 360. So 
So it's 6. Where's my finger? It's kind of like a seesaw. Has anyone here never not played on a seesaw? So everybody's played on a seesaw at one time in their life? You notice on a seesaw, usually there's a place in the middle, but then you can move the seesaw over. Why is that? Has anyone played on a seesaw with their parent? What happens when you get on a seesaw with your parent? They send you away. <laughs> I'm not going to draw stick figures here, but your parent is here. It's just going to stay down, right? So we have these little notches so you can move it over and make it shorter on your parent's side and longer on your side, right? All right, so what's going on there? Uh, what's actually going on is a little more complicated than the book explains. Um, what we have here is a force, the force of gravity, falling perpendicular to a fulcrum. So it's rotating it. <coughs> and the same thing here. And these are not forces. They're forces at the end of a, a length, and this is called a torque. Have you ever done any mechanics? Use the torque wrench? Okay, right. motorcycle, car, whatever, right? The torque wrench will measure how much torque you put on something, right? Uh, if you're trying to change the car, the tire on your car, you want something real long, right? You get more torque at the end of it. And these torques have to balance. That is, uh, let's call this, call this length one, this mass one, and this length two, and this mass two, so length one, mass one, has to equal length two, mass two. Which means if this is smaller, this has to be larger, right? So we wanna, we wanna look at this a little more mathematically, so let's, uh, we're going to put an origin here, it's going to be zero. And what are we going to find? We're going to find that uh, we're going to call this, uh, sorry, that's not an origin. We're going to call this x2 and this x1. And this point here, where we balance x average. And so we're going to have that m2 times x2 minus x average has to equal m1 times x average minus x1. I mean, this is, this is kind of what we want to know. We want to know what x average is. So if we uh, multiply this out, And we solve for this, what are we going to get? We're going to get, well, we're going to get that x average is 
m1 x1 plus m2 x2 over m1 plus m2. That is the mass times the, you know, the x coordinate plus the other mass times the x coordinate divided by the sum, which is the total mass, tells where our fulcrum has to be. So generalizing that, we could say if we had a lot of different masses, we would have the sum of the masses times their coordinate over the sum of the masses, which is just on the bottom the total mass. Uh, this particular expression, the sum of the masses times the coordinate, is called the moment. You see this vocabulary word in the problem, so. So it's the moment around this particular axis here that we happen to be using. Um, a little kind of a outer space kind of point. Let's say this thing were in outer space and I started spinning in place, it would spin around that point because you know this moment is the same, in other words, on both sides. It's right in the middle. Um, okay, so uh, now I have kind of a Vidankin experiment for you. I'm going to take off this small mass, and now I'm going to try and balance it again. Okay, so now it's at about 31. So here's the question. The, the mass here is now zero, and the mass here clearly isn't. Why is it balancing over here? The mass of the ruler, the other moments. Anybody want to think about that for a second? There's mass here, too, right? Which I really didn't take into account. I assumed it was negligible, but it's not. So how, how could I take that into account? You take all of them. You could take all, all this mass, right? It's not just at the end, it's all along here, right? Each little piece of mass is some distance from this fulcrum. And the same over here too, and then we have of course the big mass on the end. Now, if I were to take, you know, little chunks and then make them smaller and smaller and smaller, that would suggest that I'm going to do what? Integrate. <coughs> Integrate. That's right. So, let's see what that would look like. So, if I have some function of mass mass is a function of x, right? I would integrate across that mass times x. For the, for the total mass, I can integrate just the mass. And this integral would be the moment. And this, of course, would tell me where, where this would balance. Now, if I should be so lucky as to have some mass which has a constant density, then that mass is just going to be the density times the area over that, uh, over that uh, dimension. If I substitute that in, the 
density, which I'm using, it's not really supposed to be a P, it's supposed to be a row. You can see right away I can cancel the density. And now I'm, into, yes, I'm integrating this area function times x over the x direction. Well, what's the area over the uh, integration of area over the x direction going to be? It's when you integrate area over the distance. Circle, radius r. And they ask the question where is this center? Right? So we need to find the, uh, we need to find the, this is actually, I guess I should say, this is called a centroid. Point in here where. Again, if it was in outer space and we spun it, it would rotate around. And immediately you can see that um, along the uh, y-axis, uh, this point has to lie on the y-axis. Why is that? It's symmetric about the y-axis. Symmetric, right? Here you have something symmetric like this, that's pretty clear. So really, the chore here is to find the y-coordinate where these little chunks of mass times their distance from that point, or where the sum of these is equal to the sum of the little chunks of mass, in this case, because it's, uh, because it's constant density, we're just going to use area, where they balance. So what does that look like? So let's, uh, let's call this point on the y-axis y0, and this y-average we're going to look at is going to be the integral from where to where, well, from 0 to r. Uh, in this case, this area function, which is what? M Y. Hmm? M Y. Well, again, I'm, I'm going to 
instead of using the mass on the bottom, I'm going to use the, the area, right? So actually, we don't even have to write this out. What is the area of this circle here? Close. You divide by 2. It's just pi r squared divided by 2. It's the area. Well, we know the we know the equation in this circle, right? It's x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So this little area here is what? This is the x, right? So across here is 2x times dx. But now we have to include the distance from y from this point here. So that's, that's going to be our y coordinate. And I'm doing this wrong. I'm sorry, it's just 2. Right, this is 2x times dy, right? And then we also have to multiply it by y. Okay, so how are we going to do this integration? Well, we need, we need to replace x with a y, the y value, and that we get from the, uh, from this equation here. So y, of course, is the square root of r squared times x squared. So we can replace this with, now, 2 over pi r squared, integral 0 to r, 2x squared root r squared minus x squared. That's not what I wanted to do. I want to replace x, right? So it's 2 square root r squared minus y squared times y. Alright, I have this backwards. It. Now we just have to evaluate this. Um, I don't know, are there any questions about this? This is not easy stuff. Not, not really. Okay. Um, for you to work on. Uh, the first, first two, first three are work, and the last one is a uh, is a centroid problem. So.
B. Okay, are there any questions on the first couple? On how to calculate a work. Calculate the work. Everybody's okay with this? Two 
you had a sign by an exit three times the upper pi on two. So that's three pi times sine of two pi over three minus sine of pi over three. So then both of them are root of uh, two, 2 pi over, over three. 3 is kind of like that. The sine. No, the signs are, oh. Yeah. Yeah, they're the same. So it would be zero. <laughs> yeah, we found this something really neat. I'm sorry. Yeah, but it's like you say, it's like it's so easy that it's confusing. Yeah, so you think you did it wrong. So, yes. um, so the test is going to be. But, um, but, but, but it's certainly, like, if you get zero on a work problem, you certainly want to think, hmm, there's yeah. something wrong there. The test is going to be on area, volumes, and. Um, and the polar equations, the area, the area map. Oh, okay. Oh, I so is that just average value? Two to six point. Length. Average value, length, volume. Everything we did after the midterm. Correct. Okay. So actually, actually, something you did before the midterm that wasn't on the midterm. Okay. Which is volume. Um, I need help. With, I've been having trouble with this one too a lot. And um, set the volume. Yeah. So here's, we're going to rotate it around this, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a circle here, right? In other words. So what we need, is it this shaded or I cut? Yeah, yeah. It's between those two curves. But it doesn't even reach x equals 2. It's okay. It's going to rotate around. 
going to have a hole in the, in the center, right? Oh, okay, I see. Okay, okay. So, um, so there's a little there's a distance here, right? Mm -hmm. It's that distance. It's square root of x minus x. Right? And then there's a distance to 2. 2 minus? So this is, this is what they, one of those things they call a washer problem. Oh yeah, I was looking at those very confused. The distance from... So 2 minus? So the one we're going to subtract is the one from x to 2. So is it 2 minus square root of so x So it's minus? 2 minus x, but... Remember, it's the area. So, is that the radius, or oh no, that's the area. Wait, this is like the volume of the thing in the middle. Uh huh. Right. I mean, because over here we're going to have, you know, mm -hmm. right. It kind of goes yeah. all the way around. So in the center we've got a cone. Uh -huh. It's actually called. So right now we're looking for the cone thing. Let me just <laughs> tell her I will call her. I'm sorry. No, you shouldn't be sorry. I should be sorry. So it's 2 minus y squared, right? And we're integrating dy. Do you so have that, to add the pi? Oh, no, wait. I have the pi here. So it's pi oh, r squared, yeah. right? That's the r. But that only finds the area of the middle one? The volume of the middle. Yeah. Right? In other words, it's like these, they go from, a radius of 2 up to a radius of 1. And it's a cone. You see that? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so that's the inside. And then do we have to find the sphere, the sphere thing? Outside? I mean, it's not really a sphere, but then you have to find it. Right, right. Yes. well, then now we've got this thing, which is kind of like, like this on the outside. Uh -huh. And we're going to find the whole volume And then, so that. it's that minus this. So it's that, that's, well, okay, so this is this one, right? Yeah. But we can put in, I'm sorry, we're integrating in y, but this is x, right? But x is equal to y, so we can put in y. For the outer, it's the same thing. It's 2 minus. Right, right. Here now it's. This is x, right? Uh -huh. So it's. So what do we. Um... But wait, wait, I'm, I'm sorry. The distance between 2 and this, right? So, so two it's minus still of y? 2 minus x squared times pi, but now this x you have to change. is this, okay. right? So this is oh, y squared? y squared. Okay. So it's 
So it would behoove us to simplify this before we start. Take pi out. Mm -hmm. Oh, and where's it, where are we integrating from zero to zero to one? Oh no, wait. Oh. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. One. It's one. One. This point is yeah. one one, right? So it doesn't matter whether it's an x or y. So we have this, which is y to the fourth minus four y squared plus four minus y squared minus 2y plus 4y. So plus minus plus minus 4's cancel. And we get y squared minus 4 y to the fourth minus y to the fourth minus 4y squared plus 2y, 0 to 1 dy. So that is pi, is y to the fifth over 5, is 4y cubed over 3, plus y squared, is 0 to 1. And the zeros go away, so it's pi, is 1 fifth minus 4 thirds plus 1. So that's pi times 6 fifths minus 4 thirds. I hope that comes out positive. Uh, yeah, it will. No, it won't. It doesn't look good. Uh, 18 minus 20 over 15. No, that's no good. <laughs> what did I do? I do wrong. Doing something wrong because the I got um y to the fourth minus three y squared plus two y. But okay, I think I did it wrong. Maybe I found four y squared plus y to the fourth minus four plus two y. Oh, oh I forgot about y that. Plus. I forgot about that. You're no, you did, but um, I think it's. 3y squared? It's going to be plus, it's 3y squared. Well, that's going to make all the difference. Yeah, that's going to make all the difference. So it's 6 pi times 6 fifths minus 1. So it's pi over 5. So we were having a conversation earlier, and I said, eh, sometimes I'm not very happy. You said, oh, you're fine. And I'm saying, you sure you don't want to change that after <laughs> this? Okay. I wasn't doing very well. Of course, the students weren't doing very well either, were they? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? You weren't paying any attention? I was, but so I was were just getting up and walking out. What? No, I, I want to use the restroom. Oh, I didn't mean you. Oh, okay. Uh, I was just, I think, um, I don't really understand this well, because um, I'm having problems catching so, up. So, so Angie, like, had her headphones on. That's, uh, that's a real good sign that she's... I think she's paying attention. She just, um... With her headphones on? Yeah, she, I don't think she's actually listening to anything. Okay, I don't are, 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 are you just like being like cheery, happy talk? I don't know. Or are you okay. lying to me? I don't know. Oh. Here you go. I'm not mad at you. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't worry about that. I'm just, I'm just have not, didn't have a good day. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I thought this was a stupid chapter to have in this 